Thank you, Madam Chairman. And uh, thank you for your testimony. I'm going to be a bit more specific, I think, than some of the others have been. Because one area that I've been interested in and uh, worked in a lot was this uh, area of preschool. And of course, the President has proposed a preschool for all initiative to provide all low and moderate income four-year-olds with access to high quality preschool. Um, and we all agree that funding invested in early education programs save the taxpayers later on. So for a long time, the federal government has been doing a lot to increase access to these important programs. And uh, they began in the war, war on poverty in the 1960s and uh, grew to 119 programs. I think at the present time there are 69 programs. And those programs have more money dedicated to them than we dedicate to kindergarten through 12th grade. Um, now we're proposing another program. Um, there's been a Government Performance and Results Act. Uh, it isn't very well enforced. It's supposed to be enforced by the administration. Uh, that's where each agency, each one of these programs, uh, says what they're going to do and then they evaluate how well they do it. And many of them are failing. Um, what used to be education programs and we're paying for as education programs, uh, are now often uh, babysitting programs. There should be a difference in cost between babysitting and, and education. Um, when I was chairman of the HELP Committee, we studied these programs, and Senator Kennedy and I were able to uh, eliminate some of the overlap, some of the duplication, and uh, change the course of some of the programs. But there's still 60 programs out there. Um, would, was there any uh, effort in your budget process to eliminate any of these other programs, to further eliminate some of the overlap? There's a lot of money out there. Um, could that cover the preschool for all program that the President's doing? Um, would the President's proposal be duplicative of Head Start or Child Care Development Block Grants or um, some of the other programs that were authorized in No Child Left Behind, maybe even the Disabilities Education Act? Uh, was there an, an attempt to eliminate some of those to fund this? So a couple of points. One is uh, GIPRA modernization, which is something that also uh, I do am familiar, and I'm glad that we will be submitting as part of this budget uh, cycle the goals. Uh, this will be part of the implementation. When I was here before, there was GIPRA. Since I came back, right before I came back, there's GIPRA modernization, and we will be submitting uh, goals, cross-agency goals as well as the department goals. So step forward, a lot of progress in that since I was here before. Need to continue on it. I believe it's an important tool that we make, need to make use of in terms of management. With regard to the specifics in the area that you're speaking to in terms of Head Start, preschool and toddler and pre-K, yes, some of the things that we have considered. So one of the things we're doing to improve, you described, I think, aptly, that there are some child care programs that are more babysitting but not focused on learning and skill development. And so as part of this effort, you will see um, these efforts not creating a new program but connecting to early Head Start so that you build off of existing programs. And so the issue of trying to make sure that we're aligning the work, there are a couple things we're trying to do. Make sure you're not creating too many new things, do things within existing authorities, but also align with the states because much of this work is done in the states and we want to make sure that's a topic we all spend a lot of time on. And so we have tried to consider those in our proposals as we go forward. With regard to the question of can you get enough cost savings to do that. I think you are familiar with the fact that you know, even when done well, the programs, I don't know that we could get enough, but we all are always looking for ideas and approaches to improve the way we do it. Well, I, I hope there will be some emphasis on that. This is my next question, similar to what Senator Warner said. And, and uh, in the last month, the Congressional Budget Office estimated the spending on Medicaid is expected to increase by $574 billion, more than twice. 2013 and Medicare will rise from 585 to 1.1 trillion by 2024. And over the next decade, spending for Social Security and Medicare, Medicaid, and the other major health programs will represent more than half of the federal budget. How does the President propose to make these programs sustainable in the long term when the bulk of the savings that you proposed include reimbursement cuts and increased use of price controls on prescription drugs? That's so not sustainable. 
Um, I think that we believe that many of the changes that we are proposing in that space, first of all, we come back to the point that I think uh, part of the opening conversation was about, and the importance of entitlement changes. Entitlement changes are actually quite difficult. When one looks at uh, changes to Medicare in order to meet the deficit numbers that we do, so even to get our $400 billion, I think what you're appropriately reflecting is choices have to be made that are difficult. And we believe we've made those choices on best information and things like um, the GAO and MedPAC's recommendations for where people are having overpayments. And some of those issues are in coding uh, and a number of other places. And that's where we're basing our choices on in terms of what we believe. With regard to the changes that have previously been done uh, in a number of different areas, we still continue to see uh, beneficiaries getting benefits in an appropriate way. My point was, though, that those are one-time savings, and so it isn't sustainable. Thank you. Senator Coons? <clears throat> um, thank you.